Uh, we have a guest speaker in from very far away, and he didn't come here so you can snap your friends, your face, and say, what are you doing, right? So, um, we need to show him respect. I remember yesterday we were talking about agriculture and the revolution, we put that on pause. Today, uh, Brian, uh, you can call him Brian, he'll be talking about a lot of things, mostly it's finding what you want to do, how to succeed, and uh, some topics like that. But he will speak about development, because he lives in a part of the world that is developing rapidly. He'll talk about technology, um, he'll talk about urbanization, world travel, and culture, all of which are from units 2, 3, 5, and 7 in this class. So while he's speaking, just try to put some notes, like how is this related, and we can debrief on Monday. Also, um, we only had about six or seven questions first period, right? Um, he's very well versed in many topics, so please feel free to ask him any questions. Uh, and he'll be honest with you if he can correctly assess and, uh, and answer it. Um, any questions before we begin? All right. We're going to show him Duluth's best face. With that, I'll turn it over to my, my good friend, Mr. Brian David Crane. Hi, folks. <laughs> Y'all were talking the first day. Yeah, everybody's awake. I'm awake, too. So, uh, excited to be here. Happy Friday, huh? Let's get rock and rolling. This is Mr. White. This is Mr. Spiceland. This is myself. I go by my full name, Brian David Crane. That's because growing up in the South, who has had their name misspelled by somebody? Awesome. Yeah, this is a common thing. The last name, like Crane, people would spell my name Brain. It's a brain crane all the time, and it drove me nuts. So, started by Brian David Crane. Who am I? Well, this is my folks. This was in, uh, we were in Hong Kong together. This was a couple years ago. Um, I grew up in Tennessee. Uh, I grew up in a little town called Maribel, kind of like Duluth, about the same size. Um, went to university at the University of Tennessee, and uh, I studied abroad. I did a year in Argentina while I was there. Um, prior to going to university, uh, in my senior year of high school, my, uh, my family, my sister, my sister and I and my parents, we did a uh, trip around the Baltic Sea, which is the sea that's in the northern part of Europe. It touches um, Finland, Sweden, Denmark. That's the Baltic Sea. Um, we did a boat trip around there. I started a, uh, I started a recycling company in uh, high school. We were going around picking up cell phones and uh, printer cartridges and recycling those. I sold that at 24. Um, used that to pay my way through school. I don't come from money. Um, I've been working since, uh, probably since I was 13. I've had roughly a full-time job. Um, at 25, after, uh, after I'd sold the recycling company, I decided I wanted to do a trip around the world. And I wanted to do it for a year, so it was gonna be 25 at 25. 25 countries while I was 25. It was ambitious, started out. I got two, maybe three countries into the trip. Um, I was in Romania and uh, I was miserable. I was in Eastern Europe. I wound up. Good <laughs> <laughs> for Romanian student. <laughs> I know. I, I, nothing nothing against your country. No, 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 really. No. <laughs> Let me clear on this. It was not, the, the moral of the story was not uh, something against Romania, because I, I work with Romanians, I like Romania. <laughs> <laughs> to be serious, yeah. Bucharest. Okay. But I'll just stop there. The moral of the story is, is uh, I didn't have a purpose, so um, I'd gotten there and uh, uh, I was just kind of burning through cash, you know, drinking beer and just seemingly living the life, the travel life, and it was boring. Um, so I came back, made some foolish decisions, um, which is really good for me. I got my teeth kicked in. Uh, at about 25, I wound up going bankrupt. So I had been at a high, 24, went down pretty low at 25. Um, the 08 financial crisis uh, caught me by... Uh, caught me by surprise, and um, wound up reaching out to a friend who got, me a, uh, who got me a job in Silicon Valley. So I moved out to San Francisco, sort of a quintessential um, you know, tech story. Uh, lived in San Francisco for a period of time, and wound up living in Palo Alto, which is the town right next to Stanford in Silicon Valley. If you've ever seen the show, Silicon Valley on HBO, it's set there. Um, and I wound up working underneath a couple of uh, really special people, a couple of mentors, people that took me under their wing, where I was able to apprentice, um, changed my life, spent three years in the valley, um, still have 
still have a lot of friends there, still have a lot of business, uh, do business with companies there. Um, and uh, and from, a, from a business standpoint, it's, uh, it, it's a phenomenal place. So, so, so nowadays I've, I've helped launch uh, five different uh, multi-million multi dollar digital brands. The most famous is uh, a brand called archives.com, it was bought by ancestry.com, whose parents are into genealogy here. Some, some, yeah. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a genealogy business, so it was bought for $100 million cash two years after launch. Um, I was part of that team, and uh, after that I decided to become nomadic again, start traveling. So I've lived now on four continents, traveled over 40 countries. Um, I have a villa in Bali, in Indonesia, which is Southeast Asia, near Australia. And um, in the past two years, I spent six months out of the year in Southeast Asia, three months out of the year in Europe, and then three months out of the year in the States. So last year, I came and gave this talk to Jordan's class. It was a ton of fun. Got some good feedback and wanted to do it again. So where was that 13, 14? Were you guys, everybody's 14, 13, is that right? 15, 14, 15? Yeah, this is a pretty nasty looking snapper riding lawnmower, yeah? I, at the age of 13, I was salivating over a, uh, a GT Tequesta mountain bike. It was a sexy bike. <laughs> it was blue and yellow, had nice shocks. I think I could go anywhere, it was my ticket to freedom, right? I'm convinced that my parents are gonna buy me this thing. It wasn't even, I was, it was beyond a shadow of a doubt. It was like, oh, they're gonna come home, this thing's gonna be waiting for me. Sure enough, open up the garage door one day, and my dad had bought something for me, but it wasn't a bicycle. He bought me this, 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 this riding lawnmower, and he goes, he's like, you want that bicycle? You're gonna have to start working for it, and you're gonna use the money from mowing yards to help pay off this mower. So he gave it to me on a loan. It wasn't even a gift. <laughs> it wasn't even a gift. It was a good lesson. It was a good lesson. It taught me the value of hard work, if I have kids, if I have boys, if I have kids, it doesn't even matter what gender they are, that uh, would do something similar because it was, uh, um, you know, it was a, there's a biblical parable about uh, give a man a fish and he eats for a day, teach a man to fish and he eats for life. That was my, that was my learning how to fish moment. Um, it led into, let's say, my, uh, my favorite class in high school, which was a question that was asked in the first presentation. It was typing class. The most useful class I took, speed typing. You know, it's called Career Links in uh, Tennessee. I don't know what it's called here. This is a picture of my uh, office in, in Bali. Nowadays, I have a treadmill desk, so I walk and type, which is a next level. He ain't sending people. You know, um, <laughs> but it started. It started in Career Links, right? And that class was. Uh, was uh, was epic. It's probably saved me more time. You know, if you look at how much, you know, none of this. And I watched my dad, and God bless his heart, like just poking around the keyboard. And if he learned how to how to type 80, 100 words a minute, take off. So keys to success. All right. Anybody know who this guy is? Yeah, Gary. Gary V. Yeah. Uh, you on his YouTube channel? Yeah, he's. Awesome. I saw him live. Good. He's a good guy. When he killed Tony Robbins. Yeah. He has a couple great frameworks. Um, he's a big fan. He's a big fan of working with young people. I don't know if uh, any of you have been to Chattanooga, but he actually has an office in Chattanooga. He lives in New York. He's got an office in Chattanooga. Hires people out of UTC in the South, um, young people. Um, but he's a big fan of testing a lot of things, especially when you're young, and you all are in a unique position. And it's not a position that's going to last throughout your life, right? Tons of time, relatively speaking, and very few financial responsibilities. You don't have a mortgage. You don't have massive amounts of debt. You might need to work like I needed to work growing up, um, but you can test a lot of different stuff, right? I've had, you know, I've probably started or been involved in a dozen, two different, two, two dozen businesses, party promotion, recycling, internet marketing, investing, the stock market, um, lawn mowing, uh, making t-shirts, all kinds of random stuff, right? I was a translator in a hospital for a while. Um, you just find this stuff, and you have that opportunity when you're young, when you're in your teens, you're in your 20s, you can just test a lot of stuff, and you're not gonna have it forever. So my advice would be to, to really leverage that um, and, uh, and figure out what you, uh, what you like. Touch a lot of stoves. Figure out which ones are hot. <laughs> Don't burn yourself too bad. <laughs> um, 
Second part to uh, Gary Vee's advice is he says, become so good in your field that they can't ignore you. That should be the goal, right? It's not about um, coming from a particular environment. It's not about a particular skin color. It's not about a particular socioeconomic um, barrier that you've got to deal with. The marketplace is what tells you whether or not you're good enough. The marketplace is what tells you whether or not you're good enough. So you've got to become so good that they can't ignore you. That should be the goal. So this is my uh, this is my former boss. This is a ridiculous picture from Halloween. It was the best one I could find at uh, the last minute. We were at a, a German Lederhosen event. But um, he was a mentor of mine. This guy was worth north of $100 million before his age of 30. He was a crusher, right? Financially, he was a crusher. And he taught me. He was willing to invest time in me. Him and his brother and another guy. Um, and I think that's important. I think that like, when you look around at who you want to emulate and where you want to go is that you find people who are better than you. You know, Just like in tennis, where you rally with someone who hits the ball harder or serves better than you, you become better. And that's what should be the goal as far as who you want to get around. Whether it's basketball, sports, any kind of... I like sports analogies because they're a good way of... Uh, it's a skill that you're noticeably better at year over year. Um, it's the same thing with apprenticeship. And the way to get a good apprenticeship, the way to get a good good mentor is twofold. Number one is you humble yourself. You say, I don't know what I'm doing. Will you teach me? And number two is a lot of times you volunteer to just show up and do the worst, whatever the bottom of the barrel of the task is, um, to just get your foot in the door and get hustling. Gary Vee talks a lot about this, doesn't he? Yep. So it's, it's true. The, pe the, pe the people I know who've done the best are the ones who started as, a, started as an apprentice somewhere. Um, and they're also humble enough to say that they did. It's not they didn't get struck by a bolt of lightning, they didn't come from a particular family, they started underneath someone. So environment versus willpower. This is another house I was living in Bali, a couple of my friends, both these guys are um, entrepreneurs. One of the businesses I'm involved in is uh, selling stuff on Amazon through, uh, it's called Amazon FBA. How many people have Amazon Prime at home? Yeah. So if you've ever been on Amazon and you've ordered Prime and it comes from someone other than if it says fulfilled by and it's a third party, there's a whole ecosystem on Amazon of, uh, um, of products and businesses which source products from, sometimes they source them from the States, but a lot of times they source them from overseas. And um, it's an op like Amazon as an ecosystem is growing, it's grown a lot. They're opening up new markets. Um, it's an opportunity if you're looking for something to get started in early, uh, I think. I would, I would hitch my wagon personally to Amazon and start learning more about it. But the, the moral of this slide, or the moral of this story, is you only have a certain amount of willpower per day. So who makes worse decisions later in the day? When you get 7, 8 o'clock at night, you start doing stuff you wouldn't do at 7, 8 in the morning. I do. Yeah. Nobody, nobody gets drunk driving charges. At, at 10 in the morning, if they've been sleeping. I'm not talking about you've been drinking all night. <laughs> I'm talking that, like, it's at night when you start making when you start making really bad decisions. The reason for that is you lose your willpower. You only have 100 units of willpower, let's say, a day. Everybody knows Steve Jobs, dressed in black. The reason he dresses in black is because he protected his willpower. What's interesting to notice about President Obama was he did the same thing. He always wore the same blue suit every day. He would change the tie, red or blue, but it was limiting his decisions early in the morning so that he had more willpower to invest in things like, do we want to go to war with North Korea? What do I want to talk about in the State of the Union speech tonight? Picking a suit was not important, so he's protecting his willpower. That's where environment comes in, where you have to choose your inputs wisely. So who are you hanging around with? Because you, be, you really do become the average of uh, the five people that you spend the most time with. So getting around people who are where you want to go is key. Put yourself in a good environment. Play discipline. Who plays baseball in here? Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what baseball is? Okay, let's start there, good? Yeah. <laughs> so, who knows where the Dominican Republic is? Awesome. So the Dominican Republic is pretty poor. It's a pretty poor country. Um, one of the best ways to get off the island is to become a very good baseball player, in particular a very good hitter. Dominican Republic is world-renowned in Major League Baseball for producing hitters. And the reason that they're so good is they learn how to hit every garbage pitch thrown at them. So if you throw the ball at the guy's head, he learns how to hit it. If you throw it in the dirt, he learns how to hit it. Curve balls, knuckle balls, sliders, fast balls, everything you got. People from the DR are known for being able to hit it. It's synonymous with where you guys are at. 
What they say in the DR is you don't walk off the island. It means you got to learn how to hit. Where you're starting out, you're 14, you're 16, you're 18. You got to learn how to swing at every pitch. You got to learn how to swing at every pitch. And then the trick is, is that when these DR players get to the majors, they have hitting coaches who come along and smack them upside the head and go, "Don't swing at that pitch that's at your head. It's not your pitch. Don't swing at that pitch that's at your ankles. It's not your pitch." So you have to relearn a whole new set of skills, which is how to keep the bat on your shoulder, right, and wait for your opportunity. But play discipline's a hard one to learn. You got to learn initially how to hit every pitch, and then you got to learn how to wait for your pitch. Okay, so I'm a big fan of going abroad, right? Lived on four continents, traveled over 40 countries. I live abroad now. I consider myself an expat. Why do it? All right. So Cold War. Who knows anything about it? A little bit here and there. Yeah. The world as a marker. Cold War ended in 1989, 1990. Um, the world has gotten so much better since 1990. These are these are worldwide stats, right? This is from World Health Organization and uh, UNESCO, from the United Nations. Life expectancy up, literacy up 13 percent worldwide. Poverty's down 74 percent. 74 percent. That's, that's in roughly. What are we talking? Um, 28 years. You know? So it's amazing how much fast, how much better the world's getting, and how quickly it is. Homicides down 60 percent. The reason that's important is because there's a lot of. When I come back to the states, I notice how much fear there is. Um, whether it's you know the TV is constantly broadcasting fear. People are just incredible. Like there's a, there's a general climate of being nervous about the future and also nervous about what's going on outside of the states. Maybe, you know, the terrorists are going to get you. Um, there's just, there's just uh, a, 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 almost like a soup that you're swimming in. When you get abroad, you start to see it's not the case. It's not the case. Um, and what's actually the case is that places outside the states are quite a bit more optimistic. And I can say from personal experience this is true. I spent last year, I was in India. Um, I've been to every one of these countries on here. Um, but this is a survey that a, a news organization called Axios did, and they asked a thousand people in each country. They said, "Is your country going to be better off in ten years? Now, ten years, ten years from now, is your country going to be better off?" In China, eighty-seven percent of them said yes. India was seventy-four percent. The U.S. was less than half; it's forty-three percent. Brazil is twelve. Mexico is at the bottom, eighteen eight percent. I'm sure this. I'm sure this is an example. There's probably countries that are lower than Mexico. Um, for me, in the past five, six years, I've gone to Poland every year. We've got a software team in Warsaw. Every year I go and stay, and stay stay in the same neighborhood, see the same people, and they're getting noticeably better. Like the neighborhood's better, the way they dress is better, the food is better. Um, there's an optimism there. Vietnam's the same way. The place is growing eight, nine percent per year. A lot of the manufacturing that was in China is going down to Vietnam. If you're at home, how many of you don't speak uh, English at home with your folks? Yeah, you got a you got a huge advantage, huge advantage. You're able to bridge both uh, cultural, um, uh, like you're able to you can sell into the U.S. You can also speak to wherever it is that uh, um, your folks are from. If it's Romania, like there's tons of software engineers. I've worked with Romanian software teams; they're amazing. Um, I don't know where your, where your folks are from, but whatever it is, the example means that like there's some you can use that as a natural gift and as a natural gap. Um, and it's fun to go to these places where it's optimistic. It's it's like it's like if, who's who's been on a sailboat? Yeah, you know that if you're trying to tack upwind, you have the boat trying to go into the wind. It's incredibly difficult. You know, it's hard to go. It's hard to go to Mexico and build a business. It's hard to go to Mexico and build a, build a life. People aren't optimistic. They're trying to leave. This is a hard truth. Still a truth. How many of you are talking about going to college? Thinking about it, university? Yeah. Because it's the ticket to the good life, right? <laughs> this is since 1988. The number of people with a bachelor's degree in the states. So this is broken down by uh, um, uh, ethnic or sorry racial lines. Um, all the trend lines you can see they're up and to the right. Number of bachelor degree holders in the states has gone up 50 percent since 1988. So what that means? Why that, that sounds good? Everybody's like, oh, everybody getting more education. The problem with that is this. Is that if you have a bachelor's degree, it's gone down in value by 50%. You're competing against 50% more people who have the same degree that you've got. Now it might be specialized, you've got a degree in you know, biology and they've got it in psychology, but it, to a large degree, you're competing against a whole lot more 
um, degree holders. So, you have two options. You either become hyper-specialized, you go off and get a PhD, an MD, and go to law school and get a JD, or you come up with stuff that makes you stand out on your resume that's different, that's a skill. You speak another language, you lived abroad, you started a business, you are amazing at piano, you know how to, uh, I don't know, all the, all, the, all the weird esoteric stuff that makes you stand out because the degree is losing its value. So, a case in point of that is my buddy Matt. He lives in Nashville. He, own, he owns a couple of restaurants. He's on the Forbes 30 under 30 list in, uh, in the last year. He studied abroad in China. He learned Mandarin. He went to a crappy second, third tier school. He went to the University of Richmond. I went to the University of Tennessee, so I'm allowed to say that kind of stuff, right? So, <laughs> he went to the University of Richmond, he studied political science. He decided he wanted to go to work for Goldman Sachs. Super competitive. One job gets 1,500 qualified applicants, mostly in finance, mostly from Ivy League schools. He's coming from the University of Richmond, he's got a political science degree. They chose him. Goldman Sachs said, we like this kid. You know why? Because he spent a year in China learning Mandarin. And he, and he didn't go to one of the Chinese cities that was well known. He didn't go to Beijing. He didn't go to Shanghai. He was off in Hunan province or something, you know, like somewhere where you're looking at. And the first, he's the first white guy most of these people have seen, you know. So he had taken, so he'd taken some grit. He'd gotten some, uh, uh, some real experience. And Goldman Sachs, like, this is the kind of person we want to come work with. So that's the kind of thing when you go abroad, go to somewhere that challenges you. Don't go to London. London doesn't count. London counts, but it doesn't count, right? It's abroad. But you need to go somewhere. Go to somewhere interesting. Go to somewhere interesting. Go to Guatemala. Don't go to Guatemala, but go to, as an example, go to somewhere that's got some grit to it. You know? And also, you have a unique opportunity. Speaking English, being Americans, you got dollars. And dollars are going up in value. If you had just sat in Mexico since 2014, you'd be 60% richer. 60% richer in pesos just because the dollar's going up, right? So go somewhere that's going up, because you can get a lot more money. You can get a lot more bang for your buck you go abroad. Who might, how many people think Atlanta's expensive? Day-to-day -day living. <coughs> yeah? You look like a king. I should show you pictures of my, I, I was, I, I'll show you pictures of my villa in Bali at some point. It's just, it's unfair. <laughs> it's unfair. It's unfair because it's, it's affordable luxury. So, all right. Another example here about following U.S. dollar strength, another friend of mine, because I think these stories are more interesting. This guy over here on the right, Jeremy Roger in the blue, he didn't go to university. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy and I have been friends for maybe a half dozen years. Um, he's from Jasper, Alberta. It's a little mining town, a little uh, oil and gas town up in the uh, northern part of Canada. Um, he decided he wanted to learn French and German. He knew how to play guitar, got a one-way ticket to Europe after his uh, high school graduation. He lands in Europe, he starts going around to farms, what's called intentional communities. He was living in these intentional communities where you work six, eight hours a day doing manual labor. They give you food and, food and, food and board, basically, room and board, excuse me. Um, he hitchhiked across Europe for three years, learned French fluently, learned German fluently, landed in Berlin. Um, got invited to set up an intentional community in Indonesia. Went to went to south of Jakarta, learned Bahasa, which is a which, which is the language in Indonesian. Um, started a couple different businesses. He was in Bali. He sold his family. He started a business selling uh, hot yoga towels. Who's done hot yoga? Like a Bikram type style yoga, where the rooms. Who knows? Who's ever done yoga? Start there. Yes, no. Yeah. Done some stretching. <laughs> um, uh, started a business uh, selling uh, hot yoga towels on Amazon. Sold it. It's like 28 years old. But you would he's the kind of person that you would meet and you'd be like, so what have you been doing for the past 10 years? He's like, well, I've lived here, here, and here. I learned these languages. I learned how to do X, Y, and Z. And you go, that's cool. That's cool. Like, it's got a certain gravitas to a certain weight. Taking a little road, less travel. So three weird benefits. If I haven't hit a, hit home enough on uh, on uh, going abroad, because I think it's I think it's very useful. You get true confidence, unlike traveling, and especially traveling in, traveling in second and third world places that uh, um, 
let you learn how to deal with some of the punches where things don't work exactly as you expect. Unique skills and you make some worldwide friends. If going abroad is not available to you, there's still options locally. Um, when I was at Tennessee, I got really involved with the uh, study abroad program before ever going abroad. Um, it was a good way to meet and interact with people who were from um, from abroad from, and, and make some make some cool friends, people that uh, um, I've stayed in contact with and that thought about things in a different way. And it's a very fun, I can say it's very fun to be a host. To say to somebody, they've come in, you're like, what do you like about Atlanta? You take them to get barbecue. We're going to, as an example today, we're going to the same, who's ever been to a Jim Jabon? Anybody ever heard of it? Mm -hmm. Nobody ever heard of it. You know, they got one in Atlanta. World class. <laughs> Jim Jabon is a Korean spa. It's a Korean spa. It's a restaurant, spa, amazing place. They have, I think it's a 20,000 square foot facility. It's in Duluth. So I've been to Korea. I love Korea. Mark and I are going. Jordan and I went last time I'm here. You get to experience and expose people to things that you like in your city or the things that you, um, uh, that you value to people who are new to you. So it's a good way to make some friends. All right, so some stories. Uh, this is in Bali. This is uh, Ketu and Ilu. Um, I don't know if you can see it that well. Ilu is in traditional Balinese dress, but uh, um, they're the they're what's called pembantus. They come over um, and uh, help. Uh, they cook, and um, they're also friends. I went to um, Ilu's mother died last year when I was in uh, in Bali, and I went to the funeral, um, and they cremate the body. And uh, so Bali's Hindu, and they uh, they cremate the body. In, in Bali, and um, and her mom is rigor mortis, black. Her body has been decomposing for two weeks, and the, and and the kids pick the body up as part of the uh, funeral ceremony, and they wash the body, um, and then they have to carry it to the funeral pyre, which is where the where the body's burned. And you go to this kind of stuff, and you get experience, and you say, this is way different than a funeral. Imagine imagine if your parents had died, and you needed to pick one of them up, you and your siblings carry them and you have to carry them a half a mile to where the uh, um, to where the funeral actually takes place like this is the kind of stuff and you see it and you go huh never thought about this I've never been around a dead body this long I can't imagine picking my mom up gives me goosebumps to even say it you know this one was from Brazil we were down to uh, Carnival um, if you've ever been you ever seen how the you know the samba the Brazilians move? I'm not going to try to do it now. I'm embarrass myself, especially because I'm on camera. But uh, <laughs> um, amazing experience, bucket list experience. Uh, the samba drum is um, if you've been to a you know a game at the Georgia Dome or whatnot, you think 100,000 people. The Brazilians built this thing. It's like a V-shaped uh, stadium that holds 300,000 people. It starts at, it starts when the sun goes down and goes till the sun comes up, and you march through this stadium. And they're singing the songs along with you, and there's drums going off, and there's fireworks, and you are either blissed out or totally, you either can't figure out what's going on because there's just too much sensory input. Um, worth doing. Yeah, this is an example of it. There's, there's all kinds of um, floats that are made to look like dragons and lizards, and they have, uh, um, they have religious significance, so... Brazil's a Catholic country, but they have a lot of African, what they call uh, Camembert, I think is the name of the religion, which is a blending of sort of uh, um, uh, one of the, one, like, like, like sort of an African, African religion with, uh, with, with Catholicism and charged up. Highly recommend doing it. Go back to um, This is our software team in Poland. Uh, like I said, I go work with them once, maybe twice a year. Um, all speak English. Uh, all arguably more knowledgeable about what's going on in the States than I am. They watch American TV. They pay attention to American politics. Um, Poland's one of these countries is on the way up. Anybody ever been to Central Europe? Yeah, it's an exciting place. Central Europe is growing. So in summary, this is what I would say. Spend time testing and figuring out what's important to you, especially when you're young. Seek out mentors and put yourself in places where you can apprentice under those who have skills you want to learn, you want to emulate. 
play basketball, you want to go practice with Michael Jordan? As an example. Who knows who Michael Jordan is? Make sure I'm not dating myself, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't even, I mean, he wouldn't even play him unless, he wouldn't play in 2003. He's done, yeah. Um, and then put yourself in advantageous environments, including going abroad, where opportunities are more plentiful. So nowadays, one thing I forgot to cover in the slides that I think is worth it is um, I own or am an investor in three different companies. They're all interrelated to tech. One's an iOS app company, uh, one's a digital marketing agency, and then one is uh, an Amazon, uh, like an Amazon fulfillment company. So if you want to talk about that, we can do that, or if you have questions for me, um, I'd love to hear them. You talked about like how you could tell like the attitudes from the different countries were different, but yep. like, what was like the biggest difference between America and like the other countries? Well, I mean, I don't know. Americans love talking about politics. I mean, I don't know if you, <laughs> to, to the degree that it's, when you're outside of the states, it's almost a non-issue. People just don't really talk about it so much. Um, so that's an attitude Maybe that they're not dealing with, let me say it this way. How many people have ever said, you know what, I changed my opinion based on something I saw on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Replace Facebook with like Snapchat or Instagram. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> change your opinion about something you saw after seeing like, something on Snapchat? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't. <laughs> So, <laughs> so when I, when, I, when I talk about their attitudes being different, partially it's, uh, they just have a different, um, uh, there's, there's a different focus in life. And I can say, for instance, in Bali, um, if you think about that, you have a day. You have eight hours a day you tend to sleep. Eight hours a day for whatever. Uh, yeah, it's another 16 hours a day, excuse me. The Balinese, in, in Bali, the Balinese woman spends eight hours a day on average either preparing in or cleaning up from ceremonies, from religious um, tasks. So when you're in Bali, as an example, the different uh, perspectives is they work for them is like third or fourth in terms of priority. Ceremonies first, family second, work and finance not being how they see their own self-worth and how they see their own uh, value in, in the world is a distant third, if not a fourth, right? Um, so, so with that sort of, and they're optimistic about the future, but for different reasons. Indonesia's, Indonesia's growing. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question the way that you <laughs> asked it, but I answered the question I wanted to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Some other questions that I can answer the way that I want to answer, regardless of what they are. <laughs> Any questions about world travel, college, university, business, entrepreneurship, teaching yourself a language? What? Oh, I was just asking what other languages. Yeah, I was, uh, my Spanish was really good. Um, it's uh, fallen off. I speak a bit of Portuguese, a bit of French, uh, and a bit of uh, Bahasa, a bit of Indonesian. So. I like to say enough, enough, enough to get myself into trouble, not enough probably to get out. <laughs> if you were going to ask me what language I wish I spoke, it would most like I wish, um, I think Spanish is super useful, Mandarin would be the next one. Like the opportunities in China, especially when you can understand both cultures because they're radically different. Night and day. Night and day, huge advantage. Yeah, sorry, what was your question? Oh. <laughs> oh, so if we like want to start our own business, where do you recommend like we start? Like at our age, young. Yeah. What do we do? Like. <laughs> well, let me ask. Who in here has Who in here has a business doing something side hustle? Yeah, there we go. So you already got the answer to your question. What are you doing? <laughs> what kind of hustle you got going? I don't know, but I feel like I have some. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could do it. Like. Uh, I don't want to sound cliche in this, but if you did social media marketing for someone, um, you know, let's say you're somebody in your family has a hair salon or a barber shop or something, and they just need help with their like getting customers, um, you can just sit in the shop and take pictures of people who are coming out with uh, a certain do or they've gotten their hair done a certain way, 
put that stuff out on social media? Um, I, there, well, I didn't really, it's not like my business, but like there's an app called Poshmark, you know what that is? Mm -hmm. It like sells clothes, you just like, it's like Instagram, but you're selling things, so you just like post pictures of your clothes and then you can sell them online. So my family's going to Respect, yeah. Currently, what is your daily job? I don't have a job. I mean, I, I, like, if yeah. on the immigration form, when I come to the states, I write entrepreneur is my job. But it would be I, I'm involved in business, trying to grow businesses. Does that, I, I don't think of having a job. I have hours that I'm working, but I don't have a job. I'm a boss. <laughs> Um, not really. <laughs> uh, in my case, um, I studied Spanish in high school. I had taken Spanish class in high school and absolutely hated it. I think it was the worst uh, subject that I did. That <laughs> so it's just like you, yeah? Yeah. It was miserable. It was, like, it was really, really miserable. Um, and uh, then. When I got to university, um, I met a I met a French girl on an airplane um, who. Well, okay. <laughs> 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 that, was, that was my lucky. Uh, yeah, that was pretty lucky. Uh, and, uh, uh, she wound up. Uh, she was the first woman I fell in love with. We were together for two years. Um, <laughs> No, we're not. <laughs> but, the, but, the, <laughs> the, uh, but she spoke. Um, she spoke four languages. She was studying. She was coming to the states to study for a year. Um, so she was coming to practice her English, which I was happy to help with. Really. If you ever listen to French. It's just incredibly beautiful. It's a language. Um, and. Uh, but being around her and seeing her friends who spoke multiple languages is what made me say, I want to learn how to do this. So then, as far as study abroad went, um, at Tennessee you had to test into it. So you had to be able to prove that you could actually speak the other language. So I went down, um, I went down to Costa Rica and lived with a family in a homestay um, and did an intense it was a month, or it might have been six weeks, where no cards, this is old school, just one-on-one -on -one trying to hammer Spanish out. And then, when I got back to the States, I went in and took the test immediately to do study abroad. Um, and the professor who tested me was like, your, 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 your oral fluency is phenomenal, but you can't read or write to... Like, I couldn't, I was like, well, I could talk. I had zero idea what was being, like, how to write. I, mean, I wrote like a four-year-old, basically. Um, so, so the only place that they would let me study abroad was Argentina. It was like the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> they were the ones who were like, yeah, it doesn't matter. You got a 20 on the test. You can come in. Yeah. Because Argentina at the time, if they had gone through a serious uh, economic crisis in 2001. Their currency had just like hit the floor. Um, and uh, so they were looking for, I, was, I went there in 2005. They were, they were willing to take anybody. If you could walk, talk, and chew gum, come on in. <laughs> okay, so besides like the typing class that you talked about, yeah. what classes do you think are one of the most important? Like helpful? Yeah, helpful. Like, what do you recommend you take? I mean, world geography. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you have any kind of classes in uh, at Duluth that deal with uh, philosophy or decision making? Yes. Wait, it's a way to it's psychology, I think, but not philosophy. Not philosophy. Yeah. Um, I heard a couple. I wish they would. Is that, is that what somebody said over here? Yeah. Just really yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't have a good answer for that one. What else I, what else I really liked? You, 
previous class a similar question you mentioned hands-on stuff as opposed to just mind stuff right yeah. practical applications yeah yeah actually thanks mark um the any of the classes that get you out uh practicing a skill so whether it's um, whether you're interning underneath a lawyer or you're interning in an auto mechanic shop or you're doing something where you're physically practicing whatever that skill is i think that's um i think that's super valuable um and uh because I could not tell you, I, I could not tell you some of the stuff that I, I can say as an adult that stuff that we read in high school. I don't know if you still had to read uh, Fahrenheit 451. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So see that book is a, that book is like a grind for me in high school, you know. And um, but now I went back and read it in my 30s, and it's got a tremendous amount of depth, and it's got a lot of a lot going on, and maybe my I just wasn't ready for it in high school, but there's a balance of, um, I think, reading, but reading with an, with an intent to actually get the framework or get the philosophy out of the book, right? Like, Bradbury was, as an example, with Fahrenheit 451, he has that classic phrase, which is, the world is, um, uh, there's more than one way to burn a book, and, and the world is full of people running around with lit matches. And it's an analogy for censorship, and the um, um, sort of, you could argue, the political correctness run amok, that when you get older, you kind of go, okay, this makes more sense. So. Any other? Cool. Yeah, Lily? Can you teach yourself a little bit? Fall in love with a girl that speaks that language. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's, I mean, Jordan's right, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Mr. White is, Mr. White is right, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, in uh, down in Argentina, I was doing uh, a couple things that were pretty creative. Um, I would put posters up in a city that offered uh, language exchange. So I would do an hour of English if you would do an hour of Spanish. Um, I taught English, which was really helpful for actually learning Spanish because when you have to teach your native language, you realize how you realize all the nuances. So you start to realize in Spanish why they do conjugations a certain way. It makes you appreciate um, the idiosyncrasies of your own language. And you also meet some pretty interesting people because they want to likely go to your country, right? Like if you're studying English in a foreign country, they have an interest in probably going to work in the US or live in the US, right? Um, and then you fall in love with the local. Yeah. I mean, that's, because you, you you reach this. That's that's. I I mean I had a um, I had a girlfriend in Argentina, Candela, that uh, um, she didn't speak hardly any English, and it was you know I was like if I wanted to talk with this girl, I had to figure out. <laughs> what I, did. I mean, there's only so many times you can get. With language, you get to this like 15 minute mark where you're kind of like, oh, I've covered the important stuff. Like, where's your family from? <laughs> you know, did you like the meal? Where's the bathroom? I mean, the basic stuff. Then you're kind of like, okay, so what's going on emotionally for you? How are you, you know, how do you tell a story of when I was in the classroom at Duluth High School on February 2nd, 2018, and I was trying to give a presentation? How do you say that? <laughs> you have to go deeper. Yeah. And living with a family helps. No, where they don't speak English. Just immersing. Who in here has a business other than you? And I like it that you have a business. But who in here has a business? Oh, come on. Yeah, got them up. Oh, no. Oh, no. Who wants to be an entrepreneur? Who would find it interesting to own a business? Yeah? Okay. Look at this. It's the ladies holding their hands up. What are the guys doing here? Huh? <laughs> Telling you, it's, I, I, uh, I told the story in the earlier um, class where I put money into a. It's sort of an NGO called Kiva that um, that makes loans, not donations, but makes loans to um, to social enterprises or to small businesses in uh, second and third world countries. And they only have one caveat with the loans that they make, and it's that they only loan to women. It's called a it's a microgrid <laughs> program. Yeah. yeah, and they do a lot of good, but they only loan to women because the women are the ones who pay the money back. 
And I can say, and I can say, Indonesia, 100 Indonesia. This is true. Like Indonesia is very uh, patriarchal as a society. Like the men are at the top of the totem pole, the women are multiple rungs down. And um, uh, if you give money to a woman, she'll put it to good use. And if you give money to a man, he's going to go. He's likely going to go to a cockfight or have a gamble and uh, um, put money on a particular rooster, or chicken, or whatever. I don't know if it's male or female, but um, <laughs> a cock. <laughs> uh, or they, uh, where they go gamble. They go gamble on other stuff. So, um, and I just and encouraging look around, see like these girls have gone on to businesses. So. Do you think like the setting up of rape would do? Like if you were a woman, like obviously it would be harder. Do you think it would be like? Do you think? Uh, I mean, I definitely wouldn't be in the position I am today. But that question is, I mean, I wouldn't be standing here looking at you like as a woman. It's just impossible to have happen. You're, what, what, what's the root of your, I'm, I'm I mean, trying like, to. I'm saying like, as like, a standpoint, like, do you think that like, you would have to like, not necessarily bring the same opportunities, but like, have, the same opportunities? I mean, there would have been different opportunities. Because women are skilled at different things that men are. They are. I mean, um, there would have been different opportunities. I, I have... My mom's an entrepreneur. Um, she's the one in the family where I got it from. And, uh, um, you know, personally, like, I admire um, strong women. Women who, like, do what it takes to get it, uh, to like protect the family, get stuff done, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so to answer your question, I would not be standing here if I were a woman, but at the same time, like, I don't know where, I think the, I think the general gist of what I'm saying of go find someone that you want to learn from, humble yourself and go work underneath them, um, is useful regardless of gender. And going abroad, I think, is useful regardless of gender. 